Hi, I'm thrilled as I think all of the, the FOS, the Friends of Stephen, are <laughs> thrilled to be asked here, to invited here to help honor him for his uh, many contributions to the subjects that we all care so much about as a critic and as a scholar, also as an editor um, and a theorist. Uh, I'm going to begin by saying something about Stephen's contributions in another area, uh, which would, contributions that would probably not be widely known to people who haven't uh, been his colleague, and that's his work as a teacher. And I'm not getting off the program by starting this way. I'm going to say something about his teaching that I think uh, is connected to the topic of my talk. <clears throat> It's really been one of the great good fortunes of my career to have taught a course together with Stephen for many years. Uh, we think we've taught this course seven times together. Uh, and the course is basically consists of the most rewarding works that we can find from Homer onward. Um, and we teach it mostly to college freshmen. So, as a result of this arrangement, I've had the incredible experience of listening to Stephen lecture on Homer, Sophocles, Augustine, Dante, Shakespeare, Montaigne, Rousseau, Proust, Nietzsche, and the cave paintings of Lescaux. Are you jealous? You should be. It's an it was an amazing experience. It's very funny to be in this format because this is the format that we teach in much, this is a much nicer chair. Uh, um, um, it's been an incredible experience. And I want to say a little bit about what makes Stephen's lectures so uh, exceptional. Um, and by way of uh, just telling a quick story, um, the first year we taught the course together, we were walking from our offices to the classroom, and the lecture was scheduled to be on Hamlet. I thought it'd be gracious if I let Stephen give that lecture. Um, and I, I asked him in the course of our stroll whether he was planning to talk about the textual history of the play. And he said, well, he didn't think that would be very interesting to undergraduates. And I said something like, well, it might be interesting for them to realize how unstable these texts are that we study and how the text that they're focusing on is a product of a whole history of transmission. And he said, well, I don't know, maybe, you know. So we walk into the classroom and he talked for 45 minutes about the bad quarto of Hamlet. Um, and it wasn't just that he had this information at the top of his head and the tip of his tongue and could also turn it into a compelling uh, and cogent lecture. But at the end of that whole class, he made the students understand something about Hamlet from this very unpromising place where he hadn't even planned uh, to begin. So I've always believed that literary criticism or interpretation or whatever it is that we do when we're trying to make sense of these texts and these images are fundamentally ad hoc. It's all a web. It doesn't really matter where you get into uh, the web. Um, and in this case, a corrupt text could get you eventually to arrive at a holistic understanding of the object and its conditions. I've never known anyone who can do this as naturally as Stephen can. And I know he's inspired uh, many students by helping them to see the interconnectedness of the world of meanings that they inhabit, we all inhabit. And by seeing that interconnectedness, uh, understanding something about themselves. So in trying to find a topic to use to honor this great humanist, this scholar of Shakespeare, this lover of antiquity, I thought that military photography might be uh, a good bet. Um, I figured it's uh, one thing Stephen probably doesn't already know everything about. Uh, I could be wrong about that. So this famous photograph, uh, which I'm going to talk about, was taken on May 2nd. 1945, and that is a photograph of a Red Army soldier raising, obviously, the Soviet flag, and he's on the roof of the Reichstag 
building in Berlin. And the picture represents the culmination of the war on the Eastern Front that had begun uh, almost four years earlier, in June 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so on May 2nd, 1945, when this photograph was taken, Hitler was already dead. He had killed himself on August 30th. And a week after the picture was taken on May 9th, uh, Germany surrendered and the war in Europe was over. So the man holding the flag is a Red Army soldier named Alyosha Kovalov. And the man who's supporting him below uh, is named Abu Khahim Ismailov. And the version of the photograph that I'm showing you is the original image. And it contains a notorious detail, what you might call a visual solar system. And you can see that on his right wrist, Ismailov is wearing two, uh, he's wearing rather, on his both wrists, he's wearing two wristwatches. Now, the war in the East, by design, was a Vernichtungskrieg, it was a war of extermination. Both armies, the Wehrmacht and the Red Army, pursued scorched earth policies. They killed and enslaved prisoners of war and civilians. Soviet casualties in that war are estimated to have exceeded 26 million people. That's 15% of the population. When, after the Battle of Stalingrad, the Soviets began to push the Germans back out of Russia, they reciprocated the German savagery. In every country the Red Army liberated, except Bulgaria, with which Russians felt some ethnic affinities, they brutalized the population. Soviet soldiers are believed to have raped two million German women. And there was also, of course, looting. Most Soviet soldiers had never seen a wristwatch, and these became prize trophies. So the, when the man who took this photograph, uh, who worked for TASS, the Russian news agency, took the picture to the office of TASS in Moscow, his editor told him they could not print a photograph showing a Russian soldier with two watches. This man is a looter, the editor said, and it is well known that Soviet soldiers do not loot. So the photographer scraped the watch off of the negative with a pin. The photographer's name was Yevgeny Haldi. Um, that's the watch. Haldi is one of the great photojournalists of the first half of the 20th century. He ranks with Robert Kappa, whom he knew, and he's responsible for some of the iconic images of the Stalinist era. He photographed in his career every Soviet leader from Stalin to Yeltsin. And this picture here, you see him on the left, obviously at the Nuremberg trials, which he photographed. The Nazi defendant who was hiding his face is Hermann Goering, and Goering was a particular obsession of Haldi's. Haldi arranged all kinds of surreptitious maneuvers to get as close as possible to Goering to photograph him. He got some incredible pictures of his face. Goering knew from this history with the photographer that Haldi desperately wanted his own photograph taken with Goering, and that's why he's hiding his face to sabotage the picture. Like most Soviet citizens of his generation, Haldi worshipped Stalin. He was a patriot. He was a Jew, born in Ukraine in 1917. His mother was killed in a pogrom by the Black Hundreds. And the, she was uh, holding Haldi, the baby, who was one year old, in her arms when she was shot. And the bullet passed through her body into his chest and had to be removed. 13 years later, in 1941, when the Germans invaded, Haldi's father, his grandparents, and all of his sisters and half-sisters were killed along with the rest of the Jews in their town, Stalino. They were thrown alive into a mine shaft by the Germans. By then, 1941, Haldi was working as a photojournalist with TASS, 
He also had a rank of lieutenant in the Soviet Navy. He covered the entire war uh, between Russia and Germany from 1941 uh, to the end. And he followed the Red Army into Berlin, where he took, along with many other remarkable photographs, the photograph that I'm discussing. So what are we looking at, actually? First of all, this is a picture of a reenactment. The photograph, as I said, was taken on May 2nd, 1945, but the Soviets had taken the Reichstag building two days before, on the night of April 30th, and a soldier is supposed to have raised a flag on the roof on that night, though if someone did so, apparently it was either shot down or removed. By May 2nd, when this scene took place in this photograph, all the fighting in Berlin was ended. Secondly, without getting into flag ontology, that is, what, what would such a thing as an imitation flag be? A flag. Uh, we can say that the flag in this picture is a prop. Khaldi had manufactured it himself in Moscow. He'd obtained a bolt of red cloth, not difficult to find in Stalin's Moscow. Uh, and this cloth actually was normally used for, to make tablecloths for state banquets. Khaldi took this cloth to his tailor, and he and the tailor stayed up all night uh, ma manufacturing three Soviet flags. And the hammer and sickle on the flag uh, were also made of cloth, and they were sewn on to the flag by Khaldi and the tailor. And he took all three flags with him back to Berlin, and he staged photos of soldiers holding uh, the flags at different locations in the city, including uh, one uh, outside the Brandenburg Gate. So this is the third of the three flags that Hulte made and the third of the photographs or the third of the settings that he chose to photograph it in. So it was Hulte who decided to stage this Reichstag building photograph. And he recruited two soldiers, uh, Kovalov and Ismailov, and he took him to the uh, Reichstag building on seven, at 7 a.m. on May 2nd. So it's actually early in the morning when this uh, picture is being shot. Parts of the building were still uh, burning, and there was, of course, a lot of rubble, as there was everywhere in Berlin, an incredibly bombed out uh, city. But they managed to get to the roof, and then Holby set about directing uh, the shot. So this picture here was taken by another photographer. His name is Vladimir Grebnev. And you can see that although uh, one of the soldiers is carrying a weapon, the conditions are actually quite uh, peaceful. It also makes it clear that Haldi was not the only photographer who was trying to take pictures on the roof of the Reichstag building on the morning of May 2nd. <clears throat> Haldi shot many versions of the flag uh, raising. I'm going to show you a few of them. Uh, and this, of course, is the one he settled on. You can see that, compositionally, this is the most dynamic uh, shot. You can also see that he doctored the image, not only by scratching out the watch on the right wrist of Ismailov, but also by darkening the sky, by adding smoke to make it appear that the fighting was still underway and to produce the impression that the soldier raising the flag is in the middle of a firefight and is risking his life. And all these effects are enhanced by the colorized version, which you can buy on postcards uh, today in Berlin. Now, there's another reason why Haldi chose of the images that he had of this particular flag raising, the one that he did choose, um, with the flag at the exact angle that it's at, this kind of 45 degree angle that cuts across compositionally the frame. Uh, and there's a reason why he manufactured those flags and took them to Berlin, and that's because he had the explicit intention of producing a Soviet version of this photograph. And this, of course, is the Iwo Jima photograph. It was taken by a photographer named Joe Rosenthal. It's inevitable that Iwo Jima would come up more than once uh, in uh, a tribute to uh, Professor Greenblatt. Joe Rosenthal worked for Associated Press. Uh, he basically had the same role in uh, the American um, part of the war that Haldi did in the Soviet part of the war. Um, 
And his famous picture uh, was taken on February 23rd, 1945. So that's a little more than two months before the Berlin photograph that Haldi, uh, that we looked at by Haldi. Um, after uh, Rosenthal took this photograph on Iwo Jima, uh, the role of film that he used, he did not develop. It was flown to Guam, um, um, and then uh, it was processed there, and within 48 hours, the photograph was circulated around the world by Associated Press and appeared on front pages uh, everywhere. So this is the New York Times on February 25th, which is only two days after the picture was taken on Iwo Jima. Now you can see from the sidebar to that lead story in the New York Times <clears throat> that the legend of the flag raising um, that it had taken place under enemy fire accompanied the photograph in its first iterations, its first uh, appearance in the national press. So the New York Times writes that the platoon sergeant, uh, Ernest Ivy Thomas Jr., 21 of Tallahassee, Florida, was identified today as the Marine who raised the United States flag atop Mount Suribachi during the height of the battle for the extinct volcano. Yesterday, Thomas uh, broke out the ensign, which was about three feet long, while his company was under enemy sniper fire. That's actually quite a uh, false uh, story, but it, it contributed to the idea that the Marines are, again, uh, engaged in a risky uh, activity. Um, Roosevelt loved the image. He ordered it used on uh, uh, posters for war bonds. It was also on a postage stamp. And actually the same thing happened with Haldi's image. There's many postage stamps in the various uh, countries, uh, communist countries, uh, uh, using the Haldi's flag uh, image as well. And Rosenthal was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for that Iwo Jima photograph. So what are we looking at uh, in, uh, in this instance? So Rosenthal's photograph was also of a reenactment because the flag raising had taken place earlier that day on the summit of Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima, which is an unbelievably tiny island. It's about eight square miles in southern Japan. And the reason Rosenthal was there on the summit of Suribachi, uh, uh, which is also pretty small, that it's an extinct volcano, it's a little less than 600 feet high, was that he had heard about an earlier flag raising that had taken that place that day, but he had missed it. In fact, that flag raising had also been photographed, this is a photograph of it, by a man named Lou Lowry, who was a photographer with the Marines. And these photographs by Lowry show that the first flag is being removed and being about to be replaced by the second flag, which is the flag, the reenactment flag that Rosenthal's picture is of. So why was the first flag removed? Because the Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal, wanted it as a souvenir. So much to the annoyance, uh, much to their annoyance, the Marines found a second flag, a much bigger flag, and had, it, had carried it up the hill along with a length of pipe to attach it to. As you can see, the second flag is much larger. It's 96 inches by 56 inches. Uh, and it had been salvaged from the attack on Pearl Harbor. So Rosenthal was at the bottom of the hill when he heard from Lowry who'd come down and taken this picture, there was gonna be a second flag raised and distressed that he had missed the opportunity to take the first flag raising photograph, he and another photographer named Bill Campbell, along with a Marine Sergeant named Bill Ganoust, who had a movie camera, all rushed up the mountain to take pictures of the flag raising. So there were three people at the flag raising who were there strictly to make pictures of it. So this is the uncropped version of Rosenthal's photograph. You can see it's a big flag, it's a very heavy pole, but there are six Marines who are trying to raise it. The act of raising the flag took four seconds. I'll prove that for you in a minute. Uh, and Ganoust uh, was standing, who, who had the movie camera, was standing right in front of Rosenthal. I'm gonna show you his film of the flag raising. And you can see that Rosenthal's image, just like Haldi's, represents a heroic, as, as a heroic struggle, which is really, what was really mainly a very awkward attempt by too many people to deal with a cumbersome prop. It was a routine act carried out in broad daylight with photographers present and a bunch of people hanging around. So this is the film of the Iwo Jima flag raising. <laughs> yeah. So Rosenthal took 12 photographs. He took a roll of film of the flag raising. Uh, and the one that worked um, 
uh, for the same compositional and atmospheric reasons that Haldi's photograph worked two months later. Uh, that photograph is a one four hundred second image exposure of a four second act. Rosenblatt actually had no idea what he'd shot. He just shot 12 uh, exposures. He later said he wasn't even looking through the viewfinder when he took this particular photograph. He did not develop the pictures that was developed by someone in Guam or at the Associated Press. And the famous photograph was picked out by that person, not by Rosenthal. Um, and once it was selected by whoever this anonymous person was, it was transmitted by radio telegraph uh, through Associated Press, and that's how it got onto front pages everywhere, and that's how Haldi saw it, because it was reproduced in magazines and newspapers in Soviet Union as well. So it really was very, this photograph is very close to a fluke. For the Marines on Iwo Jima, as for the Red Army soldiers in Haldi's photograph, there was nothing special about the reenacted flag raising. The whole thing was a photo op. There is even a photograph of the photographers taking pictures of each other on Mount Suribachi. Uh, and this is Rosenthal's back nearest to you. And to, his, uh, to, or to our left, to his left, is uh, Ganaust and his movie camera. These two photographs are arguably did more political work than any other images from the Second World War. One of the leading claims of Soviet propaganda after the war was that it was the Russians who had defeated fascism in Europe. That's not entirely true. The Russians had little to do with the defeat of Mussolini, but it is true to a large extent of Nazism. Between June 22, 1941, when Germany invaded, and June 4, 1944, D-Day, 93% of German military casualties were inflicted by Soviet forces. In France and Italy, the communists had reasonable claim to have been the forefront of resistance and partisan fighting. So in the battle for the hearts and minds of Western Europe that occupied the first 10 years of the Cold War, Haldi's photograph was the ideal emblem. It was tangible proof that the Soviet Union was first in the race to Berlin. In the United States, the Iwo Jima photograph served a slightly more abstract purpose to feed gut-level support for the arms buildup that became, in the end, the principal reason the Cold War ended as it did. There are no similar heroic images of American soldiers after Iwo Jima. After 1945, the image of warfare became a mushroom cloud. Rosenthal's picture is a throwback. It signifies the hand-to-hand -hand nature of pre-atomic battle. It seems ironic that a photograph that became a powerful propaganda force for the Soviets and for communism was inspired by and made an imitation of an American picture. But of course, in May 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies. There was nothing transgressive about Haldi's wish to emulate Rosenthal. So what do we make of all of this? The answer is green bladian, and it has two parts, everything and not too much. So the everything part is that man-made images, texts, sounds, meaningful expressions of any kind all exist in a web of semiosis. Let us call it the World Wide Web of semiosis, www.semiosis.net. Everything is related and relatable. When it gets interesting is when the synapses fire up, when the connections carry a charge. These are the expressions that human humanists are drawn to and that we try to understand. Every paper today has been doing that. The relationship between these photographs is therefore, on the other hand, not such a big deal. Once art and ideas have been launched into time and space, they just produce unintended knock-on effects. That's just the nature of meaning. Representations circulate by imitation, misinterpretation, reinterpretation, and misprision. We happen to know that Haldi had seen Rosenthal's photograph because he said he had seen it, but the link could have been mediated, and we would still find things to say about it. It's unlikely, for example, that the photographer for Agence France Presse had Haldi's picture in mind when he took this photograph or she took this photograph at the Berlin Wall near the Brandenburg Gate. The date is November 11th, 1989. But it is a plausible answer picture to the photograph taken on the roof of the Reichstag building 34 years before. In the Reichstag photograph, the image within the compass of the picture frame, the movement is from east to west, ideologically appropriate. 
Um, and in the uh, wall image, the uh, movement is from west to east, and it is a civilian, not a soldier, holding the flag, and the gesture is made in peace. In fact, the man in this photograph was actually holding the flag of the Federal Republic to a VOPO, to a member of the Volkspolizei on the East Berlin side of the wall. The point is that any image of flag raising naturally has its place in the chain of similar images. I can sum up what I'm trying to say by letting Nietzsche sum it up. This is a passage from the Genealogy of Morals. Thus the whole history of a thing, an organ, a custom, becomes a continuous chain of reinterpretations and rearrangements which need not be causally connected among themselves, which may simply follow one another. The evolution of a thing, a custom, an organ, is not its development toward a goal, let alone the most logical and shortest development requiring the least energy and expenditure. Rather, it is a sequence of more or less profound, more or less independent processes of appropriation, including the resistances used in each instance, the attempted transformations for the purposes of defense or reaction, as well as the results of successful counterattacks. While forms are fluid, their meaning is even more so. The web of meaning making has all kinds of design at the micro level, but there's no design at all at the cosmic level. The point about art and literature is that they just keep going. Thank you.